Good afternoon. My name is Deb Arns, and I'm the Senior Museum Curator here at the Nebraska State Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you to the Society's Museum of Nebraska History and our no November 2007 installment of the Brown Bag Lecture Series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the taping of this series for broadcast on cable access channel 5 here in Lincoln. A complete listing of the Brown Bag series and broadcast times can be found on our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Our topic today is a Prairie Soldier's Service at Home and Abroad, and it coincides with the opening of the new exhibit here at the Museum of Nebraska History, entitled Nebraska Citizen Soldiers in the 21st Century. Our speaker, our speaker is Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Brewer. Colonel Brewer joined the U.S. Army in 1977. During his enlistment, he, intended, he attended the U.S. Army Field Artillery School, Air Assault School, and Airborne School. He was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1983 and attended infantry officer basic course, pathfinder course, jump master course, and was an honor graduate of the U.S. Army Ranger School. Additionally, Colonel Brewer has graduated from the Combined Armed Staff Services School, Command and General Staff College, and the Army War College Defense Strategy Course, as well as both the Czech Army Airborne and the German Airborne School. In addition to all of this, he also has a BA in History and Management from Doan College. Mm -hmm. Colonel Brewer became part of the Nebraska National Guard in 1981 and served during Operation Desert Storm. In March 2003, he was deployed to Afghanistan to coordinate training of the Afghan National Army. In October of that year, Brewer and four other U.S. National Guard soldiers were ambushed at a deserted former Russian tank repair facility and during the resulting 45-minute firefight, Colonel Brewer was severely wounded. Despite his wounds, he maintained radio contact with his colleagues and continued the fight until help arrived. Brewer was the first field-grade American officer to be wounded in action in Afghanistan and received the Purple Heart. In December 2003, Colonel Brewer ser served with the 3rd Special Forces Group in Kabul as a liaison to the Central Intelligence Agency. In May 2004, he returned to Nebraska and became commander of the Counter Drug Task Force of the Nebraska National Guard. In June 2005, the Drug Enforcement Agency tapped him for deployment to Afghanistan again, where he spent three months in counter narcotics operations. Shortly after his return home, Brewer led a multi state National Guard amphibious vehicle team in the Hurricane Katrina rescue efforts in New Orleans. Since then, Colonel Brewer has returned to Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan several times for various missions. So needless to say, I think we have an interesting hour in front of us. Please join me in welcoming Tom, Colonel, T Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Brewer. All right, as we uh, work with the electronics to get it up and going here, I'll uh, give you a little more background. Uh, first off, uh, thanks for coming today. I know everyone's busy. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to give you some background, not just on Afghanistan, because it's a key part of what's happening in Central Asia, uh, but to talk specifically about the kind of narcotics o uh, operations over there and how that's affecting the stability of all the countries in Central Asia and Afghanistan. And obviously with some of the situations that uh, we're dealing with now in Pakistan, uh, the entire mission in Afghanistan is really teetering on our ability to cope with and stop the trafficking of drugs out of Afghanistan into the other Central Asian countries. The countries of most interest to us is Kyrgyzstan. The reason Kyrgyzstan is is because we have a major air base there at Manas and that air base is the lifeline into Afghanistan. So if you can imagine the planes leave Germany they land in Kyrgyzstan, a lot of equipment is offloaded there and then put on smaller planes and flown into Afghanistan. There are no ports in Afghanistan, there are no rail lines into Afghanistan, and uh, there's no rivers that are uh, trafficable. So everything has to be brought overland or has to be flown in by plane. And uh, obviously Afghanistan is, uh, I don't want to say second place, but it is not the priority mission with what's going on in, in Iraq. So consequently, you'll see pictures of stuff that we are using in uh, Afghanistan that is not up armored. Uh, most of all the uh, heavy armor stuff is in, is in uh, Iraq. We do have some very limited amounts in Afghanistan. But for the most part, there uh, are few 
protected vehicles. So as we start going through these slides and, and uh, issues come up, uh, please, at that time, uh, go ahead and ask, because sometimes at the end it's too hard to come back and remember what we were talking about. U.S. Central Command controls that entire theater of operations. If you were to look at a map of what they control, it's really everything that we're fighting in right now. The Horn of Africa, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and potential uh, locations such as Pakistan, uh, I, Iran, uh, those are in that CENTCOM AO area of operations. So as we go through that, remember that uh, CENTCOM is really the only player right now in combat operations. Of course, we have other commands such as uh, NORTHCOM at Colorado Springs, which control things that happen here in the United States, such as Katrina. And we also have, uh, of course, uh, STRATCOM. Uh, their primary mission is survivability in the event of a first strike nuclear attack, uh, but they also have uh, additional missions. So I'm going to be hopping back and forth here, and, and again, if you have a question, please uh, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to you. A mission statement. The reason I bring up Kyrgyzstan's is because what we're doing in Afghanistan directly correlates to their ability to maintain stability in this country. Now, pretty much everything that ends in Stan used to be part of the Soviet Union. And when they broke up, these countries kind of took on their own personalities. Some countries, like Kazakhstan, become very powerful right away because of all the oil revenue. Some countries, such as Kyrgyzstan, had very little. Their, their main export is water. Uh, because of the mountains there and all, they sell water. Now, we joked with them in a second we'll look at a map of uh, Kyrgyzstan, but there is a large lake called Isikul. And they sell Isikul water. It's, it's one of their trademarks. Uh, but they also will tell you that the Russians used Lake Isikul to test nuclear torpedoes. So uh, it's a very deep lake, so you can shoot the nuclear torpedo to the bottom, I guess, and, and it goes off and it's not a big deal. But why they want to you know, mention that when they're selling you water, I'm not too sure, but that's <laughs> part of what they would do. All right, this is uh, Afghanistan. Let's real quick get an orientation. Uh, Kabul, the capital right here. Uh, most of the combat is occurring along this border with Pakistan. And uh, a lot of people, if you look at the shape of Afghanistan, where it meets Tajikistan here, why is there this little finger that goes all the way to China? And if you're, if you're a historian, you'll know that at one time the British had this empire here, what used to be India before Pakistan and India split, and to have a buffer between them and the Russians, who of course were up here then, they made this little finger that goes out there. And that was that uh, DMZ that kept the two apart so they didn't get in a fight. Uh, and most of the people that occupy this area here now are Kyrgyz or, or Tajiks. And uh, they're very, you know, Afghanistan is, is this multi multicultural place, and, and that is part of what they struggle with because they have so many different cultures within one country. Uh, if you were to look at a line of where the language changes, it would be pretty much down the center. The southern part here where the Pashtuns are speak primarily Pashtun. Uh, the northern part is more of a Dari area. Uh, of course, here's Iran over here. So the Persian language is very, uh, very common in the north. Uh, the languages are not that much different. They're, they're fairly similar, and usually one can get along in, in another's area. As you go north, once you hit this border up here, it all turns to Russian then. So if you look at Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, this is all Russian speaking. Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, they've tried to, to go back to their, their native languages from way back, but uh, it, it, so much of it's been forgotten that really Russian will probably uh, continue to be the language over there because what they've realized is it's kind of, you know, two languages they call languages of money, Russian and uh, English. Now, many of them would like to learn English, but they don't have a lot of uh, schools or facilities where they can learn it. So Russian became the the acceptable language because they do a lot of trading with the countries to the north and so consequently if you speak English and you're in these countries uh, you really have a pretty bright future because as a linguist or interpreter 
Uh, there are great opportunities right now because a lot of American companies are coming in here. Not so much Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan has had a lot of problems. You know, their, their president uh, may be a little unstable. Turkmenistan, because of a change of uh, power in the last year, has, has opened up some things that weren't there as far as opportunities for business. But uh, Kyrgyzstan is very pro-American. And the reason they're very pro-American is when the wall came down, when these countries split apart, the very next morning, George Bush, George Bush the first, called over to a friend of his who had a cafe in Bishkek, the capital, and said, I would like you to be my ambassador and I'd like to have your restaurant as our, as our amb embassy until we can get one established. And they agreed to that. And so as the sun came up the first morning after the wall came down, uh, they, the United States announced that they recognized Kyrgyzstan as a country. And we were the very first to do that. And because of that, we've taken on a special position over there with the Kyrgyz. And, uh, and we, we have enjoyed those benefits to this day because uh, they, they like Americans. And, and it's hard for them sometimes to like Americans because of the pressure from uh, China and from the Russians up here. Neither of them want us there. And they are very actively trying to uh, make sure that we are kicked out of this country for a number of reasons. And I'll give you a quick example of something that happened that caused a lot of heartache over there. There was an American contractor, worked at the Manas Air Base. Uh, he was returning from work. There was an accident on the road where a, uh, oh, not, a, not a large truck, but maybe like a ton truck, hit a pedestrian that was walking on the road and kept on going. And he was coming and stopped and rendered aid. And uh, the person died, and the next morning the front page of the Russian-owned paper uh, was that the American contractor had killed a Kyrgyz person. And so this is kind of the thing we deal with over there, is, is the truth being distorted for their advantage. And uh, never doubt for a second that the Russians are not happy about the fact that we have the large base there at, at, at Bishkek. Uh, they have a base there to t also. Um, it's a fighter base called Kant, uh, which is, is ironic because it, that's kind of what the, the joke with the Kyrgyz is, is Kant, because they've got three planes there and none of them can start, so they, they can't start. And, uh, but what they sold to the Kyrgyz people was, you guys do not have an Air Force. What we will do is move these fighters down there and we'll protect you from these evil Americans or anyone else who wants to take over your country. Well, you know, the only thing that we're doing right now is, is uh, boosting the economy of Kyrgyzstan as best we can. Uh, I think the contract on our base there is about $200 million a year. If you looked at all the other contracts that we have in the country, probably another $200 million. And right now, I don't know that the Russians are really putting a lot in. Uh, they, on occasion, will, will give them some old used equipment or something to make them feel better. But where they're really struggling is in the southern part of the country, uh, down in this part here, uh, is where what's called the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan is very powerful and uh, they're doing terrorist activities. They're, they're doing a lot of things to destabilize the southern part of the country because uh, what, what you'll see on a map of Kyrgyzstan, and we'll go ahead and move forward to that now, is that uh, there's a, a very distinct line between the two portions of it. Okay, here's Bishkek, the capital. Osh is the next largest city, and if you were to see a line where it splits the country, it would come right about down the middle here. Now, this is very mountainous, and... Uh, uh, Lake Issykul would sit in this vicinity here. The northern part is Russian Orthodox. The southern part is Muslim. But they're not fanatical Muslims. They're just uh, very, I guess, the easiest way to explain it is they spent so many years under Russian dominance that they, I mean, if you don't go to church for 80 years, you kind of lose the desire to go to church, and you kind of don't remember a whole lot about why you went there in the first place. So even though they may wear the headdress and all, uh, during Ramadan, they, they, don't, they don't pray, they don't stop eating um, for the most part. And so working with them was a lot easier. In Afghanistan, working with the soldiers there, they did. And so you had to stop, you know, six to eight times a day to let them pray. And you had to limit what you did in the way of operations or training because from the time the sun came up until the sun went down, they couldn't drink or eat. Well, if you're doing you know, uh, ex uh, extreme operations there, uh, it isn't long and they go down as heat casualties and you're, you're done anyway. So because part of what we did in the way of this mission I just returned from in Kyrgyzstan required us to be out doing operations during Ramazan, it was refreshing 
to not have to manage that, that situation of, of, uh, of what we had in Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan. Now, you'll see these locations here, Ketchikan, Botkin, Hydrocon, Bordova. These are main points of entry into the country. If you could see from Afghanistan here, coming north, there's only about four roads, and this are four points where they come through. So what we do is we set up spots where we channelize them, we can inspect the vehicles, and try and stop the trafficking. But what we found was that they would simply take and unload stuff and bring it through other means to get into the country. So we've got forward operating bases at all these locations where they live and work every day. And uh, we had initial success because we were able to seize and capture the drugs coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, what happens is these drugs are then brought north overland into Kazakhstan, either in, from there into Russia or into Central a uh, Europe. And uh, about 95% of all the drugs, heroin based, that are in Europe or Russia come out of here. Now, worldwide, it's, it's close to 90% that Afghanistan is producing too. So they're not just de destabilizing these places. Obviously, the drugs are affecting others. But because of the vast sums of money coming into this country and, and those surrounding it, uh, it's given an open door to the mafia-like organizations that come in here. It's caused corruption in the government, uh, which didn't need a lot of reasons to be more corrupt. So consequently, there is discussions by Parliament of kicking the U.S. out of here because they're taking so many payments from the drug runners going through the country. So if we don't stop the flow out of Afghanistan, we're going we're gonna to ruin our chances of being able to stay in countries like this. And it'll in, then invite the Chinese or the Russians back in. So it's all interwoven and, and, and it's very complex. And you'll see as we go through these slides how heartbreaking it is to know what's wrong and not be able to fix it. Uh, I had to show this to you. Uh, this is near Osh, and we stopped there, and again, what, what we're doing was a site survey to look at, at uh, some of the locations where the uh, drugs were trafficking. This is part of the, the very southern part of the country that's very fertile, uh, and, and consequently, uh, it, it used to be the breadbasket for the Soviet Union, and now they produce a lot of, a lot of uh, fruit, nuts, things like that that are sp sold commercially and it's becoming more profitable for them. Uh, the problem is they lack basic farming tools other than hand tools, uh, tractors, plows, those kind of things. So it limits a lot of their capabilities. Uh, but just to show you the mentality of the folks you're dealing with, this guy here, he's one of the lieutenants for the border police, uh, and he stops me and he yells at this lady who was walking down here along this canal and asked her to come up, and she came up and of course, they're always trying to impress you with different things. And, and so he takes this from her. Uh, she had it over her shoulder. She was carrying a bucket on each end of it. And he was showing how this would work, that you can carry more weight because you balance it on this stick. And they've got this new invention. They cut a notch in here to keep the bucket from sliding off. And I kept thinking he was going to have a, a punchline to this, but he was serious. He was all <laughs> proud of the fact that they'd figured out how to do this notch. And so we're just about to give him $500,000 worth of high-tech equipment, and all of a sudden we had to stop for a second, take a deep breath, and go, we may have uh, missed the mark here in understanding what their true needs are. And, and it really, <laughs> they have a big heart. They want to do a good job, but when it comes to technology, um, they're not there. And, and so... We gave them a lot of equipment that was really useless to them because it was too high tech. But we're, we're fixing that. We're working on it. I want you to think we just gave it away and forgot about it. All right, this is another one that shows these trafficking routes that are coming up from the south. Uh, they, they come right into Osh, and there's a town right here of uh, Jalalabad, and then they'll come into the area around Bishkek and then off to either uh, Kazakhstan or into Eastern Europe. All right, if you were to see this country, this is what it looks like. It is absolutely one of the most beautiful places on earth. Uh, this was in uh, late June, and we are at about 14,500 feet, and that's where this crossing point is that we're standing on top of right now. This goes down into Afghanistan. If you go the other way, it would take you into the inter inner part of uh, Kyrgyzstan. But you can see these are just trail roads. There's nothing that's paved. 
But this is the route that the Russian army, I should say the Soviet army took into Afghanistan when they invaded. They moved 4,000 armored vehicles down these roads all the way to the Tajik border and then invaded from there in Christmas of uh, 19, 1980, what was it? I'm sorry, 1978. And uh, a lot of them were in the Russian army. And they told you about this whole ordeal. And it sounds like they started with about two more thousand than that, but they scattered them along the road that they broke down. But <clears throat> they all remember fighting for the Russians in Afghanistan. So as you, as you kind of quiz them about history, I'm kind of a history buff, they would tell you about this whole experience in Afghanistan and how early on in the war they sent the Tajiks, the, the Uzbeks, uh, the Kyrgyz in to fight because they were Muslim and they figured that the Afghans wouldn't fight a fellow Muslim. Uh, but what they didn't understand is, is the, the Afghans for thousands of years have not appreciated invaders. So uh, they fight and they fight well. Uh, no, one, no one will ever deny that the Afghans aren't good fighters. That was one of the experiences we had after we taught them uh, how to, to become an army because they were just these ragtag groups of this old northern alliance that we had to build into an army is that we would we would come in contact with the enemy and they would simply charge these machine guns and and you know it, it was just a waste of life because we were trying to teach them how to fire and maneuver and and uh, they caught on to some of it, but uh, they really believe that it's up to Allah and and we didn't but this is the headquarters uh, this is the, the nicest building in the area there and as you can see, it, it is a leftover of the, of the Soviet days. Um, it's very primitive. Uh, they, they really are the, uh, some of the poorest people in Central Asia here, the Kyrgyz are. But they have a big heart. Uh, they, they, set us, they, they fed us as much as we wanted to eat. The, the, the problem is that they don't have a whole lot. Uh, you, you have rice. And of course, these are the, this is the like Sunday going to church kind of China. And uh, it's very... Uh, it's very old. Uh, you can see the cups and, and everything about it. It's very primitive. Uh, the soup was a mutton. I got a lot of sheep over there. Uh, but you didn't want to make a steady diet of this or else, uh, um, you know, it was kind of hard on your system because they, uh, they can live on a lot less than us. Let's just put it that way. It's a, it's a good weight loss program. All right, this is my bedroom. I want to share this with you. Just to give an idea how we're equipped. Now, what we've done now is we've done our survey of the border region, and we're getting ready to go in to Afghanistan and to stop the drug trade. So we're prepping here. This is at uh, Bagram Air Base. And uh, normally when you would leave, you'd have your, your issue rifle, and here's your issue pistol. You would have a vest, a ballistic vest, and then you would have this, which was the hold your magazines. There's 14 magazines here in this vest. Uh, you would have this as a 40 millimeter grenade launcher and then one of these three machine guns depending on the flavor of the day that you want to take with you. But normally you would leave there with about uh, 120 pounds. So, and most of that is ammunition and water. The best way in there is on a C-130 and you would leave the northern part and it would be winter like this and you would fly just a hundred miles and you would get into what was almost like a desert. These are Russian transports, AN-76s. They're making a mint off us right now because they're the heavy airlift of all the stuff going into Afghanistan. And they fly around the clock bringing in heavy stuff. They can fly a tank in there if they want. Uh, the United States has zero tanks in, Kyrgyz in uh, Afghanistan. We have no ground combat equipment in Kyrgyzstan. And because of uh, the Russian influence and, and the negativity that they put to everything we do, uh, everything we do in Kyrgyzstan is, is just basically a dismounted, whatever you carry is all you have kind of a situation. Afghanistan, of course, it's, it's full up, except we have decided to bring no armor into the country. We do it all with, with uh, Humvees and, and not a lot more than that, uh, trucks. C-130, you can see it coming in. Uh, dirt runways, and this is uh, as we land. Uh, we use these because they have the extended fuel range. Go a lot of places. They can land about anywhere, and uh, they're great aircraft. We use a lot. Use them a lot. Uh, we can back uh, jeeps and things like that in there. We can't get anything too big in them. Uh, but uh, that's our chariot to get us to a hub, and then from that hub, we then cross level to a helicopter that can get us in. 
Uh, this here is uh, normally what we do is once we get in, we set up what's called a tax sat. That's this system here. Now you'll see my guys, uh, they don't look standard Army issue. Uh, most of the special operations guys uh, will grow beards and, and have longer hair simply because they'll be 30, 60, 90 days downrange doing operations. And you don't have a barber, you don't have a place to take a bath or anything else. So, uh, you know, you got to live hand to mouth day to day. And uh, it's just about impossible to look too strapped. All right, the CH-47 Chinook, this is, this is how we get to where we're going to go for the actual assaults once we get there. Uh, we can put about 45 combat-loaded troops in the back of there. Uh, we will normally fly the Afghans, which the Afghans that assist us on this counter-narcotics mission are from what's called the NIU, National Interdiction Unit, out of uh, Kabul. And uh, they're highly trained uh, Afghans that are, are specifically for the counter-narcotics mission. Now, the problem with just saying they're trained for the counter-narcotics mission, you've got to remember that the counter-narcotics and counter-terrorism are all woven together. So you can't say that without being prepared to fight as a soldier. But they know how to identify the drugs. They know how to identify the laboratories. All the things are associated with the uh, production and distribution of, of uh, the uh, drugs. Again, these are, the, these are some of the roads. Uh, absolutely wicked terrain. And uh, if you're an RPG gunner and you want to ruin someone's day, you can set up in these rocks and launch RPGs all day long, and it's pretty hard to, to reach out and touch you. So as you're moving by ground convoys, it, it poses a lot of challenges. Also, it takes a lot of time just to go a few miles. So if there's any way possible, we go by Chinook, we move by foot, and we leave the vehicles back as, as best we can. Now this is what we have to deal with when it comes to transporting the drugs. They'll put them into mule convoys like this, caravans, and they'll take them through the most remote mountain passes, just like what you saw in that previous slide, only where there is no road. And there's, there's literally no way to track them or set an ambush for them unless you want to get out and really get into some extreme conditions. But they can move, you know, a, a 10, 15 million uh, dollar uh, load of heroin on these... Uh, uh, mules or, or camels, depending on the scenario, and, um, and move it through a region that you have no way of even making contact with them there because it's so remote. This is what you would see if you were looking at black tar heroin. It literally looks like uh, roofing tar, and this particular box represents about a uh, quarter of a million dollars. So you can imagine how many you can put on all those mules and how quick you can move it out of the country. Now, there's two types of drugs we run into. The unprocessed, which is the black tar, and then the processed. Depending on the laboratory facilities, they can refine it to the point where it's, it's almost pure grade heroin and it's ready to take to the streets. And they're very proud of it. They put their, their marks on it and the, and the lot numbers and the year and the whole works. Uh, they, they, they don't mind showing off their, their wares. This Nissan pickup here represents a lot of what we would use over there, something like this. It would fit inside the CH-47. We could move it down range. Um, there's no protection. It's no different than what you drive here on the street. But it, it means we can load stuff in back and move it without having to carry it on your back. But again, you'll only be able to move to certain locations where you can get a four-wheel drive into. When we capture them, this here is an NIU guy here. We capture them, we simply get their name, uh, the date, location. This is a lot long location where they're, where they're arrested and then they're uh, processed. Uh, some go to jail, some don't. It's a strange system over there. We don't fully understand it, but uh, they are turned over to the Afghan authorities. Uh, President Karzai uh, is very supportive of the counter-narcotics effort over there. But, you know, Karzai's brother has been arrested for, for narcotics. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, just a very complicated, difficult situation. Um, you know, sometimes you'll have folks who arrest that are relatives of, of a mayor or, or a tribal member that uh, is too key to our mission over there to not somehow give him some leadway. If we catch you twice, then that's a little different story. 
And then once we, once, once you're, <clears throat> the drugs are taken, we burn them in place. We don't try bringing them back or anything like that. They're loaded and uh, brought back for processing. Some end up at Bagram, some end up all the way to Gitmo. Kind of depends on who and the situation at the time. But uh, on average, from the time we take off in the morning till we get back, we, we burn up about four to five hours of flight time. And I would say on average day, we'll, we'll seize over a million dollars worth of drugs and probably arrest 10 to 15 people. That's kind of the, the routine that we, we develop. And, and a lot of the information on where to look for these labs comes from our predator aircraft, our unmanned aircraft that are able to identify the lab facilities. And here in a little bit, I'll show you a lab and you can see what it looks like. Most of the labs are outdoors, not indoors, so you can see them from above and know what you're looking at. And I just more Chinook pictures. But you can see the pickups, the pickup trucks that we brought in here. It's fairly common that uh, they, they'll dig these underground hiding places like this, and they're well camouflaged. It is very hard to find them. We have a ground, oh, try and think of the metal detectors that you, you use. Uh, it's similar to that, but it uh, actually just works on acoustics and lets you know if there's any voids underneath, and we use those to try and find these caverns, because a lot of times you'll sweep through, you'll arrest somebody, You'll see some guns and stuff, but you won't find the drugs. And the reason you don't, it's all stashed down here. And so you can walk off and move on, and they'll come back later and pull it all out. And You know, so you, you really have to look hard to find some of it. And just because you find one cache doesn't mean you got it all. Yeah, it's just down in the hole. Not a fun job. All right, this is just one house. We seized uh, about $3 million worth of... Uh, processed heroin out of just this one house. Now, that's in addition to the machine guns, the explosives, RPGs, and the other things that you find. So you can see it, it isn't just taking the drugs off the street. It's also taking all the weapons and, and other resources out of the hands of the guys that are out doing this. Now, normally, if you do it right, if you strike fast and you strike with a lot of force, they don't put up a fight. But uh, on occasion, they will. Uh, and and you know, they have the right kind of resource to, to give you a pretty good fight. Here's a uh, scale. Obviously, everything is pretty, pretty well packed and organized. They're, they're pretty efficient in the way they do things. Uh, the reason that we're focusing on this level of counter-narcotics and not the poppy fields, because you hear about all the poppy fields, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of square miles of poppy fields. We cannot affect that. The other part is, these guys buy the drugs from, uh, well, the processed uh, residue from the poppies from the farmers, and then they bring it in and process it at the lab. If we're taking out the labs and we're, we're taking out the middleman, you know, then there's nobody to pay the farmer, but we're not the bad guy because the farmer's already got his money. And the guy up the chain, we try and use the intelligence we get from this to figure out who he is and get him on the other end, too. And I'll, you'll see here in a, a little bit some, some ways we, we capture the guys on the other end, too. Before we start operations, we, we, we all sit down and do an operations order, try and get in as much detail as we can. Um, this is pretty typical of even the homes. They truly are mud huts. They're, they're out of mud. Uh, we, we used to joke that if, if the country saw a week of rain, it would dissolve because there's, there's no wood frames, there's no rebar, there's nothing like that to hold it together. It's just stacked mud. The, the, the people are so poor, they have nothing but you know, a little bit of water and, and mud. So that's what they build everything out of. There is not a tree in the country hardly. They have stripped everything to burn in the wintertime. And that's the terrible thing about if you go into cobble right now, you know, there's a, there's a residue in the air that's just horrible. And, and so what they're burning is tires, uh, anything that burns. Uh, so consequently, there's just a horrible residue and pollution over, over the major cities. That's just some of the train from the air. All right, this joker here. We caught him, and we come in, we found all these bags, and they, they were like kitty litter or cat food bags. And as we tore them open, they were full of the, the black tar caked stuff. And, um, and he had an incredible amount. This is one guy in one house. And so, anyway, he got a quick trip out of there. 
Uh, this is, you can see it here. It's kind of a, kind of a cake-like stuff when it's hardened. But it, it goes in here in a plastic, and then they put it in there, and they pour it in there when it's hot, and they reseal it. That's just more of the process stuff. When we burn it, we usually try and make a public event of it so everybody understands what happened if, if you're caught with it. And uh, some get the message, some don't. Uh, it is a source of income for so many that sometimes you, you really are in an awkward situation because you know that you're going to take away their livelihood by destroying this and the livelihood of a lot of them around there. But we're trying to work with State Department. The State Department is struggling right now. Their primary focus is on the eradication of the poppy fields and, uh, and trying to find an alternate crop. And they're struggling with that. And part of it is I don't think they have enough farmers in the State Department to understand how to do it right. And I, I won't go into any of the brutal, the brutal truth on, on the State Department, but I just think that uh, there are alternate crops Afghanistan in the 1960s and 70s produced enough food for its entire population and exported it. So to get back to being able to produce pistachios and, and uh, walnuts, pecans, all these things they used to produce over there uh, would not be hard if they could just provide more resources to the farmers themselves. Uh, the reason they use the poppy, the poppy is a weed. It, it grows wild. It would be like thistles or something. And you don't have to do anything, just let them grow. And uh, so if you went in and you offered them a chance to grow something that they could eat as a food, I still think that that would be a, a good seller. But they just need the seeds and, and the tractors and a way of planting them because they're too poor right now to do it. But nobody listens to me, so. All right. When we go out for extensive periods, um, Unlike Iraq, where you primarily work out of FOBs, forward operating bases, and live in fixed facilities, and eat out of mess halls and that, in Afghanistan, it's a wild and woolly world. And uh, you put out 50% security, otherwise half of you're out on guard duty, and half of you're sleeping, and you rotate. Uh, you set up these little dome tents, and it'll get 20 below zero, and, and uh, you can't start a fire uh, because people come to visit you, you don't want to have visit. And, uh, and you got to survive out there. So, uh, you you got to be in good shape for one because to hump these hills at between you know 10 and 12,000 feet to sleep out in these conditions and to be able to hump these packs all day long, uh, you, you got to stay in pretty pretty hard condition. Uh, as you can see, uh, you don't carry very much uh, because whatever you have, uh, you know that's that's what's with you 24/7. We would normally drop our rucksacks when we do the raids and. Uh, and have a kind of a patrol base where we drop our rucksacks and you would go with just your body armor, uh, ammunition, and, and maybe a small day pack or something. All right, again, my point on, you know, shaving's pretty hard over there, so you'll see a lot of these guys look a little rough around the edges. Uh, it's, just, it's just a fact of life. Uh, but you can see the conditions over there. It is really, really hard terrain. But to get to where a lot of the labs are, you have to be able to walk this because uh, if you try flying in too close, they hear you coming in, and they'll either be ready to meet you with stuff you don't want to meet, or they'll destroy the evidence. So you got to land miles away and walk it in. And usually it'll take a day or two sometimes to even walk in there. All right, another seizure. Again, this is a mix. You got the black tar stuff here. Some of this was obviously hot. It's still leaking out. Some of it's processed. Uh, you can see the wood pile here. That's part of what they have to have to, to cook this stuff is uh, a good source of water and wood. So that's usually a signature you can see from the air that'll let you know. Uh, normally there are a lot of weapons seized at these locations and ammunition, things like that. Oh, and here we are. These are precursor chemicals that are used uh, in, in the uh, processing of the drugs. There's a Pakistan license plate. I pulled that off one of the vehicles. <coughs> Uh, weapons. Here again, here's two AK-47s that are chrome-plated. Um, uh, here, here's a Bernelli shotgun. So it isn't just AK-47s you run into when you're over there. Uh, these are rounds out of the RPG. Of course, these are designed to destroy tanks, so uh, they can really ruin your day in a vehicle or inside a building. 
And you can see these guys are pretty happy about burning this stuff. Uh, we actually give them a bonus depending on how much stuff they help us seize and all. That's kind of their incentive to find more. We give away toys and stuff to the kids because this is a pretty shocking, traumatic experience for these kids to have a bunch of, you know, big Americans kicking in the door and hauling out all this stuff and, and arresting family members and all that. So we do what we can. Sometimes you win their hearts, uh, sometimes you don't. She wasn't very happy with me, I don't think. But, uh, you know, you do what you can. We just don't want to, you know, put the kids in a situation where you come and do something like that and you, you don't leave them at least something for, for the whole traumatic experience they go through. But it's hard dealing with the children, especially for a lot of the guys who had kids back home. You don't see your kids for months and, and then all of a sudden you have to go in and do something like this and, you know, to walk away and leave these kids all shook up and all, it, it's kind of some way to kind of offset that. Again, flying around. All right, I took this because this is a State Department. Got to love them. They come up with the idea of let's buy Russian helicopters because they're cheaper. And uh, this is uh, like a 1960s version. It's, it's been rehabbed. So, you know, try and imagine having a 65 Impala. They just rehabbed it, and you just got that, and everybody's telling you it's a great deal. <laughs> well, keep in mind, this is their fuel cells. They're on the outside. A little Russian thinking there. And uh, they didn't fare very well during the Russian occupation of Afghanistan. They kept being shot out of the sky or exploding in midair. So we decided to buy them because we're in Afghanistan doing the same thing. The, uh, the hel helicopters ended up getting modified some. I'll show you that in the next slide here. There's ballistic plates we put on and some radar warning kits. The radar warning kit is for shoulder launch missiles because keep in mind, we gave them about 900 missiles. They shot about 500, and the others are still floating around somewhere. We hope to find them somewhere other than our tailpipe of our helicopters. So this warning kit they designed, uh, the American ones work real good on our Blackhawks. This one basically warns you just before you blow up. There's, it doesn't kick out flares to let you know that something's going to happen or to stop something. But uh, it's a fairly solid aircraft, it's just like any Russian design. It's, it's real, you know, the stuff that would be... Uh, Car carbon fiber for us is cast iron for them. But what happens is we load up on this thing and we go out on a mission and about 500 feet up in the air, about uh, a mile from our location, a rotor blade flies off of it and there we are. So you can see us back here, we're trying to get out of there and marry up with a Chinook because uh, they actually stay in the sky. That's a side shot of it as we're walking away. Now, once, once we got away from the aircraft, because we still had uh, a radio on there that had uh, classified information in it, we made the decision to uh, call in an airstrike. And so that's what happens when a 500-pound bomb hits a MI-17. But the amazing part was, you can see, we had two Chinooks in the air flying in that general area. The bomb hits, it explodes. Uh, and, and the reason we had to stay close is to make sure people didn't come in and get close to it before that bomb hit and we, we killed people, you know, unnecessarily there. Well, what happened within seconds of that bomb impacting, look at this, hundreds showed. And, uh, and they're not there to do anything bad, they're just local people, you know, if you're out in nowhere Afghanistan and there's not a lot going on, and all of a sudden a 500-pound bomb lands and something's burning. You know, everybody comes to see what's going on. Plus, you know, you might be able to pick up a few spare parts and pieces because, uh, you know, we have people that collect aluminum cans and that. These guys, they p pick up anything. If it isn't a rock, if it's something they can sell or use, they take it. Um, but it makes a lot of complications when you want to try and destroy something. That's something like this that had secret stuff on it that we had to destroy. Uh, but fortunately, we were able to get out of there. Nobody got hurt. But... It just shows you how complex it is when you're doing operations over there and how easy it is to have, you know, an innocent bystander killed in some type of scenario. Where were the people coming from? Was there a village nearby? Uh, there was a village fairly close. Okay, this is kind of an example of uh, uh, where we would plan operations. Uh, we would just put out a poncho and we'd plan ops and then kick out of there and off again. Most of the the areas that are built up have walled compounds and consequently you got to 
you got to knock down a gate or, or blow a hole in the wall to get into these compounds. So it adds another degree of complexity to the missions. Sometimes we go in by fast rope for a number of reasons. Sometimes we'll fast rope into the middle of a compound. Sometimes we'll fast rope in uh, because the, sh the pilots don't want to land because there's landmines. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, that's, it comes with the ground. This is, uh, this is a normal seizure that we'll get. Literally, out of one place, you will get dozens and dozens of uh, Kalashnikovs, thousands of rounds of ammunition, uh, rocket propeller grenades, the whole package. But we'll also see stuff like this. These are satellite phones, and we'll take the satellite phones, we'll trace them back, the calls they've made, and figure out who they are, and then we'll use our satellite technology to then keep, a tra keep track of their other calls. And, and normally, we get, we get some good... Um, good hits on, on how to stop the trafficking through these, these different things that we seize. They are pretty good at building fake IDs, and, uh, and that's an effective way for them to change their IDs and, and get different passports, and, and so it, it adds a, a complication to, you know, the international uh, travel and, and uh, keeping an eye on some of these folks. All right, this is a laboratory. You can see the barrels here. That's normally what they'll bring the precursor chemicals in. Those normally come out of China, Iran, um, sometimes Pakistan, but, but not, not a lot out of Pakistan. Normally there'll be a well that water can come out of or a trailer where you can uh, bring water in. This is one of the tanks where they actually cook it. And uh, the chemicals are in there. What happens is once they go through this boiling process, they'll, they'll stir this stuff. It'll then separate they'll let the, uh, the liquid residue evapor evaporate off of it and then they'll lay the rest of it out to dry. Okay, here's more of the chemicals. There's the wood pile to heat this. There's where it's laying out to, to dry and it'll be packed into bags that'll weigh about uh, 25 kilos, about 60 pounds. There's the lab burning. Okay, these are the bags I talked about. You can see how many were taken out. This is one lab, one lab of thousands. Ah, prisoner. Okay. What I'd like to do now is kind of open this up for questions. Um, obviously, this subject we would talk about for hours. Uh, and again, I skipped the part about the war that we're fighting in Afghanistan and talked about what we need to do to be able to, to, to stop fighting the war because we're never going to be able to leave unless we get a handle on the drug situation because that's what's funding and financing the insurgents that are fighting us. So, you know, if you can imagine all that and then add to it the complexity of the fact that what they're doing isn't just destabilizing and causing all the problems in Afghanistan, but to all the countries north of there where it's trafficked. And, you know, ultimately it's affecting Eastern Europe and Russian places where all the drugs are going. So, you know, Afghanistan is a critical part. You know, there's a lot of folks that say just, why don't we just leave Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, obviously we do that, it'll turn into that same hub of activity it was before 9-11, and we're gonna have to go back in there and we'll lose more lives than the next time. Uh, so, getting a handle on the drugs is critical. Are we making good progress? We're making progress. Um, we probably don't work as well with State Department as we should. We don't work as well as we should with ISAF, which is International Security Force Afghanistan, which are the NATO-type countries that are there assisting us. And part of that is, is there is not an intel fusion cell where all this intelligence is brought together and shared on counter-narcotics. We do pretty good about on the war fight, uh, but not on counter-narcotics. The DEA becomes that hub, and they're not manned at a level necessarily that they need to be at in order to be successful over there also. So anyway, I'll open it up to questions. Yes. I could. Um, when, uh, when we went into Afghanistan in the fall of 2002, I'm sorry, 2001, uh, there was nothing but a shell of what was the old Northern Alliance. And uh, it was a mix of, of the Northern tribes. And uh, when we defeated the, the uh, Taliban and Al Qaeda, pushed them over the border, uh, we started forming through the Bonn Agreement the country of Afghanistan, that's when Karzai was selected and came in to be the president. Uh, we had to build an army, and this is not something we normally do. I mean, we haven't had to build armies. We usually fight armies. 
So what we had to do is, is bring folks in, in kind of a special forces role, to build this, this new army, and we had to build it out of the pieces and parts that were left from what the Taliban left behind, what the Northern Alliance had, and it was mostly junk. It was stuff the Russians had left there. So in addition to the Americans that were doing a lot of the instruction, we had to bring in the Bulgarians and the Romanians and the Czechs and the Poles, and they knew how to fix this Russian equipment. So it became a true um, coalition that uh, built the, the Afghan National Army. And the Afghan National Army was a success story. It was well done, and it was well managed. They were good fighters. And so when we turned around and went into Iraq, it just seemed like we could just use the same footprint and put it over there, poof, success. The problem was the Iraqis weren't the spirited fighters that the Afghans were, and we probably leaned too hard on assisting the Iraqis as opposed to the Afghans. Uh, the Afghans, you just kind of got to point them in the right direction, and they're going to take care of it from there. So that was our job, was to build the Afghan National Army, and uh, our, our goal was uh, 55,000 soldiers. I think they're about 75,000 now. Uh, part of that is that they have had to take on a policing role that we hadn't planned on. The failure in Afghanistan is the police force. The Afghan National Police have a long ways to go. And ironically, in, Af in Iraq, they did a good job with the police, and the police are pretty darn good over there and, uh, and getting a lot better. So our, our burden right now is to build the Afghan National Police to where they could do a better job of managing the counter-narcotics mission. Other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, the problem is the State Department gets real narrow-minded when you start dabbling in their area, and they consider that their area. And it's kind of a heartbreaker for us because, especially within the National Guard, we have a lot of guys who are farmers, and they understood exactly what these guys needed, but yet no one would listen to them to, to make the right resources available. So what we have pushed for, and what looks like it's going to happen now, is a agricultural PRT. A PRT is a... Uh, a provincial reconstruction team and they're placed all around the country and they're basically a cell of about a hundred soldiers which it wouldn't be just necessarily soldiers it could be Navy or Air Force whoever they get uh, to occupy this this particular uh, PRT and they work with the locals and they help them with issues with their wells for water and schools and things like that well now the idea is we're gonna build one for agriculture and we're gonna put them in the key regions and we're gonna teach them how to farm and we're gonna give them the tools but that's still being shaped, and, and we don't physically have on the ground one of those over there doing it yet. But uh, I have volunteered to go over and command the first one if, if they'll let me do it, because I think that is, that is the key to success. But again, if you don't have someone who understands agriculture making these decisions, it's hard to force them to, to make that a priority. Okay, other questions? Yes. All of this looks like basically old Soviet-style weaponry that you're counting over there. Is this old stuff that's been left and laying around, or is there <coughs> new uh, sources of weapons coming into that region from other places? Good question. Uh, here, here's our situation. The Czechs have 800 tanks that they're willing to give away. Take them. They're yours. We don't need them. The Cold War's over. But we sat down and did the math, and, and for the airlift to move all these tanks over there, it was incredible. It would have been hundreds of millions of dollars. So what we've had to do is rebuild what's in country over and over again, and we brought in some old American equipment. But uh, we, we're kind of limited on just what we can, we can use over there because of what already exists and what we can get from Pakistan or, or neighboring countries. Because some of the old Soviet countries to the north will give up their stuff, because they don't really see a threat of, a, of an armed invasion from another country right now. You know, they don't see China coming or Russia coming. So they're willing to sell off their stuff. Plus, they're poor enough, they can, they can do that and actually help themselves to be able to do some other things with improving roads and things in their countries. So we are able to buy some stuff, but the lion's share of it is continued to be old Soviet-type stuff. And, and because of the cost, I don't see that changing anytime soon. And they understand it. It's real basic. You know, it's like an old Model T car. You know, it's not fancy, but you can repair it. Yes, sir. How's the, the justice system? When you do this interdiction and you pick up these people who are involved, uh, they have to go into a justice system. There are a lot of countries. The justice system is very corrupt, and you don't get the results you want. Uh, is it a decent judicial system? 
It is a good system that needs a lot of improvements because of, um, I guess, uh, a system that rewards who knows who as opposed to necessarily someone being prosecuted solely on the uh, event or, or, you know, whatever the crime is he committed. And so you'll see some walk who, like I said, are, are related to certain people and some that are prosecuted uh, to the fullest extent of the law for the minor c crimes. And so it's not always fair, but uh, it is their system. And we have vowed that it's their country and, and we're going to let them work it. Sometimes we're brokenhearted because we don't think it's done right. And other times, you, you know, you're pleasantly surprised. But it's not even across the board. Yes. You know, in the press we read about the tribal leaders and, the, and Karzai's central government. Are a lot of these tribal leaders getting a cut off the drug business? <laughs> Ooh, you would have to ask a tough one. Uh, I believe some of them are. We have no way of obviously of, of outright knowing that. But there, are, there have been efforts to give away what we are doing to some of the drug lords before we get there if we interact with the local governments. And there's no way to, to, to sugarcoat that. Somebody there is telling them we're coming. So what we've done is we quit telling them. We don't tell anybody where we're going or what we're doing, not even in the U.S. government, uh, because there's even channels there where things, stuff leaks out. And so it's all a big surprise when we come in. Now, that's not always worked to our advantages because sometimes we show up and, and there are some folks there who are kind of key players that all of a sudden are getting arrested and then everybody's up in a tizzy over it. And uh, so, you know, you, you walk a tightrope with that. But what we've found is that uh, there are connections within the highest part of the local government that will give away what we're doing if given the opportunity. Any yes. Addiction uh, problem? I mean, are any of the Afghanis using these? Drugs no, we we rarely see anything like that, and it's because they're so poor. I mean, you don't see people smoke cigarettes because they're so poor they can't afford a cigarette. So any money they can get is is for helping their family to be able to heat their home or or, or food for the table. Yes, ma'am. It looks like there's Afghani people helping you on your missions. Is, that, is it dangerous for them? Is it, is it risky for them to become a part of the Afghan National Army or to assist you? Not the Army. The Army is very popular, and, uh, and they're there in enough force where it's not a problem. The NIU, the National Interdiction Unit, the, the counter-narcotics folks, think of the, the DEA agents of, of Afghanistan, it is for them. Some of them have been beheaded. Some of them have had family members killed. Uh, it takes a lot of dedication to do that job, and, and, uh, and fortunately we have some, some really outstanding uh, males and females that have volunteered for this duty. We keep them in a special compound in Kabul. When we go out in missions, most of the time they'll wear a scarf or, or maybe a balaclava or something to cover themselves, uh, but they are at tremendous risk if, if they're identified. Yes, sir. Is, uh, is the effort directed at the, at the labs? Uh, having the results that you wanted, or is it going to take uh, the crop uh, uh, destruction in addition to the lab destruction? Or, or how's that work? I think without a orchestrated effort to give them an alternate crop, we will fail because it is too large of a volume of a product, and it's 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 like uh, you know that that game you see where you you smash the head down, another head pops up. It's kind of that way with the labs. Uh, and the reason it is is because there's such a flow of stuff coming in. And it's worth so much money, and they're so poor, you know, how can you help but try and sell this product once you have it? And if you're out there selling it sooner or later, someone's going to buy it if they think they can make a few million dollars. And if, if them making dollars depends on them being able to kill Americans or disrupt what's going on, that's where at least part of that money will go so that they can continue to traffic. Yes, sir. Maybe it's off topic that you don't want to comment on. But could you, do you have any comments on Pakistan and what's happening over there now? Well, uh, <laughs> this is where I kind of got to let you know. Yeah, I've, I've transferred up. I'm now at the strategic, uh, strategic, I keep wanting to call it strategic air command, at SAC. And, uh, and I'm aboard the, uh, the NAOC, the National Airborne Command Center, which, uh, of course, what we're dealing with is a lot of what's going on there. So, so what, I'll, what I'll do is give you what I can without getting into the secret or top secret realm. But 
there is a lot of concerns because Pakistan, how many nuclear weapons do you think Pakistan has? Several. Between 50 and 100 nuclear missiles. And I didn't think they had that many. I was shocked to find that they had that many nuclear missiles. Some are, are in silos, some are aboard Scud-type missiles that could be turned to Afghanistan or Iraq at the uh, drop of a hat. So all of those have to be targeted. And we have to do that in a way so that uh, there are certain triggers that, that gives us a heads up that that's happening and we can make that happen fast because you launch a tomahawk from a submarine in the ocean somewhere, it takes a long time to get to where it's going to go. And so consequently, you know, you, you have to think about all these scenarios because the fear is that Pakistan becomes an Iran, just like when the Shah fell and, and, the, and the, the crazies take over and now they have their fingers on the buttons of the nukes. So remember that when you, when you, you, you know, a lot of what Musharraf's doing, I don't agree with, but I like him being in control of the nukes as opposed to what the other options are. And uh, until they kind of get their system figured out and they get these elections going and getting the right people elected and, and stabilizing, I'm okay with the martial law and, and, and what's happening because uh, it is too critical to the world. Because look at the position they are. Think of what would happen if a, if a missile was fired at Israel. They're not going to just stand by and let that happen. There's going to be retaliation and then other countries retaliate. And pretty soon, you know, you have such a mess on your hands that, that uh, there's no way to, to fix anything. It's just going to be a World War III. And so Pakistan is key right now to that whole region and what's happening. Because they have the largest army, they have the best equipped army. And then what's Russia's feeling? I mean, they're a lot closer to this than the United States. Uh, you need to hold up for a second? Okay. I think Sorry. we keep going with questions. Uh, you know, Russia's a strange duck. Uh, because they, they're willing to sell weapons to these countries and then complain about the situation, um, but the personality of Russia is morphing as they become more and more wealthy because with all the oil revenues they have, they're really, uh, Russia is putting more and more money into their military. We're seeing that now. Things that, uh, you know, their Navy didn't used to exist after the Cold War. They parked everything. They got rusty. Well, I got news for you. They're buying and building, doing a lot of neat things. And, uh, and they're adding a whole new complexity to things because they're willing to sell some of this to folks. And uh, Pakistan has benefited from some of that in technology. And what that means are their missiles are more accurate, their, their weapon systems are more dependable. And, uh, you know, w we know where bin Laden is. I mean, roughly, we, we, we pick up satellite pings of, of sat phones and things that kind of give us a general vicinity. But he's so far tucked into that Northwest Territory, we can't go get him. You know, we take an airborne division and we would lose a lot of people, not to mention the fact we'd destabilize Pakistan overnight if we were to do that. And, and he, you know, he's, he's a broken, sick old man living in a cave. He's not real combat effective right now. It's all these little cells out there that are, that are plotting and planning to do things that are the danger. And that's where, you know, we're going to see something happen that will affect a lot of people. And, and they are targeting locations where they know they can break our backs. New York is one. If you shut down Wall Street, or you shut down one of our major ports, or you hit a major refinery somewhere, and they're not going to mess with our refineries. That ain't worth their time. They're going to hit the major refineries in Saudi Arabia and shut down the flow of oil out of there. And you're going to see eight, ten dollar fuel a gallon. You know, and that's when you break our economy too. And these guys are no dummies. Al Qaeda is pretty darn good at figuring out how to how to hurt us. But it is nothing short of a miracle that we have gone this long with all these guys thinking of ways of ruining our world that we've been able to stop a lot of these plots that, that have been schemed up. Yes, sir.